Well, as we look at our, our verse, our chapters, uh, the chapter that's before us today, it's incredible what we've seen, isn't it? We've seen in chapter 17 that empire that the world has set up a false religion. It's all been bundled into one. We, we learnt last week how suddenly that's going to be uh, destroyed and fallen and absorbed into what is essentially this uh, city. Um, this is an amazing place, an amazing city that is going to be created here. And if you can imagine through this tribulation period, we have in effect what is um, from a worldwide uh, empire, you could say, that's being established over time that culminates together at a three and a half year period, we have um, out of the ashes, as it were, like a phoenix rising, um, this city that is being built by the person that we know as Antichrist. Now, this world leader, he, he sort of sets himself up, doesn't he, as this world leader who um, he, he comes from, in essence, nowhere. He rises to power and he slowly through his guile, through demonic deception, takes control of the world. And through this false piece of that first three and a half years, this time he uses in a way to set up, to set up this empire and out of that empire as well. And I think a big part of this empire that he sets up is in fact this amazing metropolis, this amazing physical city, which we see here in Scripture is known as Babylon the Great. So it's an amazing thing that he, he does, he works through. And through our chapters here today, we're going to see seven facets of judgment that God brings upon this great city and also the reasons why. We're going to see seven facets through there. We're going to see the decree and we're going to see um, many other things as we move through. And if I had my first two chapters of nights, I could outline that, first, that perfectly for you. I think they're sitting on the table at home after I was uh, just reading through those to make sure that all was good. Um, I won't be doing that again. So anyway, as we move through, you're going to see these seven, seven facets. And the first one is the decree. And you see here, um, John says, after this, verse, uh, first thing we see, after this, after what? After verse 17, after what we saw there with that destruction of the false religions of the world empire, and, 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 and he says, no, 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 you can't worship anything else because I have had this death, burial, resurrection sort of thing as a, a false god who's pulling off some sort of deception as to um, the Messiah almost from biblical times. He says, you worship me. And all other religions go. He sets himself as God in the temple of Jerusalem. And that is the desolation of abominations that we know uh, through uh, in Matthew 24 and Daniel uh, chapter 9. And, and so we have um, that scene set up for us. And after that scene, John says, after this, after what has just been, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. So he sees another angel, that's Alos, another angel who's coming down from heaven. Alos, the Greek word, another, means another of the same kind. Well, what kind is that? Another of the same kind is chapter 17. Another of the same kind. So this is an angelic being, like in chapter 17. He's come down from heaven, but we hear and see something It's really uh, quite amazing um, in terms of this particular angel, he says, uh, coming down from heaven, having great authority, having great authority. So this angel has come down out of the presence of God, and he is given great authority, the authority of God. And um, let's call him Ambassador Angel. Ambassador Angel is coming down with the authority from God to give an announcement. And it says here, and the earth was made bright with his glory. Now that's interesting, isn't it? The earth was made bright with his glory. Now on a sunny day, if you turn on a light, what happens? Do you see the light very well? Don't, do you? So what's happened? Well, to have great brightness so that this angel illumines the whole earth. It's in darkness, isn't it? It's in darkness. So if we go back to, um, and I'd be a lot more efficient at this if I had my... <laughs> So 
So when the uh, judgments are poured out on the earth, we see quite an issue in terms of the fact that, um, and we'll look at verse 17 of uh, chapter 16. It says, the seventh angel poured out his bowl in the air, and the voice of the, uh, and with, with a loud voice uh, came from the temple of the earth, the throne, saying, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning and rumblings and pearls of thunder and great earthquake. It has never been seen since man was on the earth. And the great city, what city is that? The great city. We're looking at that today, aren't we? The great city. That is Babylon the Great. Um... And the great city was split into three parts. And the cities of the nation fell. And God remembered Babylon the Great to make her drink the cup of the wine of the wrath of his fury. And every iron flew away and so on. So here we see um, here uh, an inkling of what is about to happen, what we're looking at. But further back, uh, if you remember, um, God poured out his... Um, his fury on, uh, and I think it's back in 14, but sorry guys, I'll have to uh, tell you afterwards. But um, if, do you remember when God poured out, the lights went out, in effect, darkness came upon the earth, and everyone uh, went and gnawed their teeth, uh, gnawed their tongues, and, and, and said, who's going to save us from the Lamb uh, and from God Almighty? And so at that point, the world is in darkness. The, sun, the sun's gone out, the stars have gone out, the moon's no longer, or most of it. Um, and, and so we have the world is literally in chaos. It's in absolute darkness. And here we have pitch blackness, probably the lights of the cities and things like that, uh, illumining things. But all of a sudden, if there is power at all, all of a sudden the brightness of Ambassador Angel coming down. Can you imagine the, the, um, the phone feeds as he's coming down, looking at... What's going on? The whole world, it says, will see. And of course, it's easy to, to know that this is the case because uh, today we have in our pocket a supercomputer with a camera that's probably better than the camera we have on the shelf at home. And so that's going to be broadcasting all over the place. CNN and um, all these other, uh, Al Jazeera, are going to be playing these feeds of Ambassador Angel coming down from heaven. And he calls out with a mighty voice calls out with a mighty voice. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every detestable beast. Wow. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. So the, the judgment that's given by one of the three flying angels in chapter 14, do you remember that, the flying angels? One of them said that Babylon will fall. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. Well, that was the announcement, and here, the announcement in culmination. The, the announcement that it will happen, it's right now. Judgment is now. Can you imagine that? Wouldn't that just send shivers down your spine? And there's reasons given. What are the reasons? Because it, Babylon the Great has become a haunt for every unclean spirit. Do you remember, we looked at a little while ago, all those demons that spewed from the pit. 200 million demons spewed from the, the abyss, unchained, released, bound up, now released, full of anger and fury. Out they came, not far from where Babylon the Great will be as a city. And so it only is sort of fitting and, and I guess logical in many ways that Given the, the nature of the people there, given the fact that they, uh, they love evil and doing evil, and they love um, worshipping themselves and worshipping um, their newfound Messiah, quote-unquote, um, you know, it, it's only logical that they would find a happy home in Babylon. So it has become a dwelling place for every unclean spirit. Now, consider all those satanic practices that there would be there. Because that's what it is. If they're not worshipping God, well, they're worshipping the devil. Is how it is. And so um, I'm sure that even demonic possession would have been a welcome thing in that city. And it, he, go, he goes on, we read it, um, it is also a haunt for every unclean bird. And this verse depicts the total destruction of the city. If you imagine 
um, and we, we depict it sometimes in the movies and things after there's been a battle in the desert or something, you see the birds flying around. Well, this city has the carrion birds, the, the vultures circling the city. It's been, become a home for this because of the, what is about to happen and, and what is in the city already, a death. It's, been a, it's become a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. So in the same way, um, there is these detestable birds. There is an unclean and detestable beast, and that is heaven's depiction, really, of everything else that is unclean. It's putrid to heaven. Now, you've got to remember here that this city in itself is putrid, it's sinful, it's in every way foul and everything opposed to God. It is also, its influence has permeated through every aspect of society to all other parts of the world. So if, if you will, this is the, the virus center that has spewed out its horrible culture to the rest of the world. And he says here in verse 3, do you see that verse 3? For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. You see that? And the merchants have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. So you see here that the world has become overcome by this city, city's culture. And the whole world has now got this lust for this materialistic lifestyle of possessions, lust for parties, lust for drunkenness, uh, lust for lewdness, lust for worshipping false deities, or deity in this case now. And one commentator notes how similar the fall of this Babylon here is to the Babylon of ancient times. In Daniel 5, if you want to read that. So we see here, he says, they've drunk, they've imbibed, they've brought into themselves the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. You note it there how we, the, the city's described here as a harlot. And it's the sexual immorality that, in a way of picturing the uncleanness of the activity of what, one would do with a harlot. That is how it is seen from heaven's point of view. And yes, of course, that would have been a part of it as well. That sexual immorality would have been there. Verse 4, see, that's, this is the call out. If you're not picking, taking notes, then uh, this is my next heading, the call out. Because you see in verse 4, heard another voice from heaven saying, and this is again another voice, this outlaws again, this is another of the same kind. So that isn't the same voice as the angel who came down. That's not Ambassador Angel, but this is another voice from heaven. And this isn't Christ, because if it was um, another of a different kind, that would be heteros. But that's not heteros. It's another of the same kind. So this is another angel from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. The grace and the mercy of God in the midst of what is to be utter, complete devastation. Now, if we're looking at this verse and we're saying to ourselves, as we step back for a second and say, well, what does this mean for me today? Well, here we have an ancient writing of something future. And here we sit in the middle before it happens. And we think, well, what is the principle here for me? Because that's the, the only real and safe way of looking at this. We look at it and say, we draw a principle. Here we see that in the midst of judgment, God's grace still resides. In the midst of this, God calls his people to purity. He calls us to be apart from the world, to be apart from that which is all of that city. Be apart from that. So that's a principle that we can draw back from here. So we have... This, another voice, this other angel from heaven saying these things. 
And it's very clear that God is calling his people to leave the city. Now, we don't know if these are people who are already saved and living and dwelling in the city of Babylon. And you've got to remember this great metropolis, it, it sprung up out the ground in such a short period of time. You know, let's say he came to power at the start of the tribulation. It's three and a half years to build a city of the, the, the scope and the grandeur of, say, uh, Seoul or Dubai. This place is immense. It's beautiful, full of lights and everything that the eye could want. So where else would you want to live but the stronghold and the, the security and the safety that this city would provide? But the other thing it provides is everything for the flesh. And it provides everything that is demonic. And so God says, come out of her, my people. Are they saved or are they to be saved? We don't know. But they are God's elect. And maybe this is a call to salvation. We don't know. But God calls out. He knows his people. He knows who are his. Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. We know that God has some of his elect there. And God has always commanded his people to come out of the world. And this is a clear reminder, that principle, come out, be apart from the world, be separate from the world. Colossians 1.13 says, he that is Christ has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. We have, if we are trusting or believing in Christ for salvation, we've been taken out of Satan's dominion. We've been taken out of Satan's dominion. And we have been transferred and placed firmly in Christ's kingdom. That's what verse um, 13 of Colossians chapter 1 says. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to obey its passions. Do not, be, uh, do not present your members as instruments to sin for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members as God's instru instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace, Romans 6, 12 to 14. Sin has no dominion over us. If we are in Christ, be apart from the city, be apart from this world. You are no longer of this world. You are bought with a price. You are now a part of Christ's kingdom, Christ's world. You are slaves of righteousness. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable and perfect. Come out of the city, my people. Do not partake of her sins. God says, chapter 2 of, uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians 16, uh, 6, 14 to 17. I always struggle with verses, don't I? It says, do not be unequally yoked for, with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord is Christ with Belial? What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What, a, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Do you see how, as Christians, we are to be a part of this world, a part, being separate, not a part of, but a part, separate from this world? Yeah? We are commanded to live separate from the world. Those who are living in the real city of sin, Babylon the Great, are told to come out, be separate. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. And the reason he's, he says this is, again, principles we take. Why shouldn't we part of, be part of the world? Lest you take part of her sins. You see that there. Lest you take part of her sins. Come out of her, my people. Lest you take part of her sins. Why should we be separate from the world now? 
so we don't partake of the world's sins. It's very simple. For the same reason that we are told to be separate from the world system, God's elect of Babylon are told to come out lest they partake and are seduced by that materialistic lifestyle. Isn't it easy to be seduced by the world lifestyle? It's just, it's just like boiling the frog, isn't it? You put the frog in and you turn it up slowly until that water boils. You don't even notice what's going on around you until it's too late and you're dead. And so it is that it's so easy to take part of that materialistic lifestyle of possessions, lust for parties, drunkenness, lewdness, and sensuality, and all of a sudden your mind is overtaken with the things of this world and you're forgetting to focus on Christ. Do you remember Joseph back in Genesis when Potiphar came to him and tempted him and tempted him and tried to grab him and he said, how can I do this thing and sin against God? That's where all sin is focused. It's not focused against so much your brother, although it is. It's focused against God. That is why God will judge sin, because it is a sin against the holy, eternal God. Be like Joseph. Run out the door, exclaiming, how can I do this thing and sin against God? For all that is in the world, the, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. It's from the world. 1 John 2.16 And the whole world lies in the lap of the devil. It is his, his domain. He usurped God in the garden, as it were, although we know God allows things like that. I'm not saying God isn't in full control, he is. And that's any, anyway, that's the reason why God says through his angels to the elect of Babylon the Great, come out of her, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. Now, some people view these plagues, as a very interesting point, uh, as to be the bold judgments from Revelation 15, 1, uh, 6, 8, and 16, 9. And by the way, they are the ones I was trying to find before. They're in chapter 15, not 14. There you go. They can't be worldwide. How can they be worldwide? That doesn't make any sense. If God says, come out of her, my people, but these plagues are worldwide, where are they going to go? They can't hide somewhere else if these plagues are worldwide. Do you get me? Yeah. So, therefore, these are special, wonderful plagues that have been reserved simply and solely for Babylon the Great. Isn't that a scary thought? God's focus is very much on the single city of Babylon the Great. Yes, there are other plagues that are going on worldwide. Those other plagues in Revelation 15, 1, 6, 8, and 16, 9. But here we have special plagues. And I think it is actually fitting and right to think that these plagues are going to coincide with the seventh bowl judgment as we read before in 16, 9. Because that's, as we, we see it, we'll, we'll read it again. It says, the great city was split into three parts. This is 1619, sorry, 1619. Um, the city was split yeah, into three parts. And the cities of the nation fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of his fury, of his wrath. So there we see God's special attention. That's a scary thought. It's good to have his special attention when it's in righteousness, but when it's because of sin, that's not a good thing. And another reason for his sins are heaped as high as heaven. Uh, and literally in the Greek, the word heaped is um, kalao, meaning to glue together. Or we could think of it as a stack of pancakes. That, you know, when you put them on together, they stick to each other because they're moist, right? And you pile one pancake upon the other to see how high you can get your pile of pancakes. Well, this one goes up pretty high, heaped as high as heaven. So all the sins have reached like a Tower of Babel up to the heavens of God where God has remembered her sins. God has remembered her iniquities. God has not forgot because God doesn't forget anything. He may be set it aside for a while, but he is going to come back and he's come back to it now to give them fullness of judgment. 
So then we come to judgment defined. Judgment defined. The angel, as he talks to John, he outlines now uh, the judgment and any praise. So here we have almost an imprecatory prayer. Do you remember the judgment prayer or asking for judgment prayer? As um, Psalm 58, if you want an example, would be an imprecatory prayer. And he says, pay back her, uh, pay her back, sorry, as she herself uh, paid back others and repay her double for her deeds. A very uh, Old Testament um, law coming in there of uh, repaying uh, double. Uh, mix a double portion, make it full, make it overflowing, make sure it is a full measure. A double portion basically means a full, don't miss out anything. Uh, mix a, a double portion for her in the cup she has mixed as she is glorified herself in luxurious living. Uh, so give her a, a like measure of torment and mourning since she says in her heart, I said as queen, I am no widow and mourning I shall never see. Wow, pride. You see that? Pride. God will judge pride. If you have pride in your heart, repent, because God will judge it. And okay, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, yes. But if we are prideful before the Lord, and we can be even as Christians, repent of that. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day. Wow, in a single day. Death and mourning and famine, she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. For strong, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. Isn't that amazing? You know, some people accuse God of injustice in the Old Testament when they, he judges the nations, when he, he, he brings um, these cities and, and peoples to judgment. God uh, judged Edom, didn't he? And uh, he judged many other um, nations as well and he used Israel in many cases to do that and they say that's not fair how come God can come in and just kill off that people why would he do that well because they were child sacrificing murdering people and God gave them many 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 years if not centuries to repent and they didn't and so it is here the same thing God's grace is extended to these people he has had so much going on in terms of um, the gospel being preached, in fact, I don't know of a time in history when the gospel is so prominent and so clearly explained. You have 144 Jewish male evangelists going throughout the world preaching the gospel to every single people. A more, completely more, hugely more um, comprehensive gospel presentation to the world. You have an angel flying throughout the air preaching the gospel day and night. I bet you some of them said, will someone shut that angel up? I don't want to hear it anymore. You had two witnesses in Jerusalem preaching the gospel, and they killed them. Then they came alive again and sent it to heaven. So they have had so much in the way of gospel message. They had to be judged because they have not received the gospel. And many other reasons, as we'll find out. But how are we to pray today, now in the day of grace? Remember, we aren't in the tribulation, and we aren't in Old Testament times. We sit in this pause, if you will, in between. And so what are we, how are we to pray for those who persecute us? How are we to pray for our enemies? How, what are we to do with them? Well, Romans 12, 14 is one to memorize. It says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all, if possible. So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all and he goes on and says give room for the wrath of God it is vengeance is mine I will repay says the Lord what do we do as Christians we do what is right and we trust the Lord to do what's right are, are we holy are we just in our anger we'll give injustice and sin but God is holy and he will repay 
perfectly. And then we see grief over Babylon's destruction. Um, and we see that, don't we, as we move through verse 9. And we've got this sort of uh, lament that's coming. Most laments are laments over sin. But here we have a, a lament over a city because they can't sin as they did. Do you see that there? The kings of the earth and those who join with Antichrist in, in chapter uh, 2, all those world leaders. Um, that's of verse 17, uh, chapter 17. They um, lament the destruction of Babylon. Notice how the angel describes their sinning those who committed sexual immorality with her. And again, that's that word picture of the, the harlot. The city was a stronghold. Of, it was the pinnacle of Antichrist power. It was the seat of the economic system of the world. And it also symbolized world evil and the, world, the system of evil in the world that is now to be completely and has been, if we look forward, completely destroyed. So they will what? What will they do? They... They will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They also stand far off, and again, that points to the fact that these plagues are localized to a city, because how can you stand far off if they're global? Anyway, um, they'll stand far off, verse 10, in, in fear of her torment. They're going to see this and think, this is a, just an absolute fortress of a place. This can't be destroyed. Look at all the other things that happen around the world. Babylon the Great still stands. It's one of those things, you know, have you ever sort of knocked your food aside and you've eaten everything else and you saved the best for last? I think that's what God's done, right? He's knocked all the, all the peas aside. He's eaten all the peas and he's left the meat to last because that's the juicy bit. And so they're thinking, oh, there's security, there's safety. It's the economic powerhouse. We're making money here. Life is good. We can continue. The, uh, the, the Antichrist guy, he can't be killed because he's been killed and he's alive again, so how can he be die again, right? So we're, we're invincible here. All of a sudden, judgment's coming, the, the city's burning, and they're standing far off going, oh, no. Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. Do you remember before I said in a single day? No, have a single hour. Verse 8 tells us her plagues will come in a single day. Death, mourning, famine. She'll be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who will judge her. And whether it's a specific actual day or a specific actual hour, I think what we must think of here, this is coming really quickly. It's fast. And all the merchants of the earth Weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. What? They don't mourn over their sin. They don't mourn over their sin. They're mourning because they can't make money. So we've got these merchants of the earth, the businessmen, the salesmen, the business owners. They've lost the source of their wealth. And it's really from this point forward that the economic system of the world has ended. Because this is the last bastion. This is where everything, this was the hub. You knock out the, the, the hub of a wheel and everything just falls apart. And that's exactly what happens here. God knocks out the hub of the economic system, which was that stronghold of the world that gave it semblance of stability in the midst of chaos. And it just falls over. Now we have this list of uh, the, the, the different types of cargoes or, or, or things that they were trading in. We've got a list here of uh, 28 opulent commodities. They are opulent. You know, they are, you know, you, you see this um, silver, or gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, uh, what else you got, scented woods, ivory, uh, kinds of uh, wood, bronze, iron, marble. Then you've got spices, incense, frankincense, myrrh, uh, Oil, fine flour, we, we get that cattle, sheep, and, oh, and human souls. Hmm. Who trades in these? Well, you have to be really wealthy to be able to trade in these. The one at the end, the human souls, is very interesting. You know, I, I think um, that it, it will be the case that because 
the Holy Spirit's restraint on sin has been removed from the world, that people will go back to openly trading in people. No shame in that, I'm making money. Well, that's all that matters then. Only the rich could have bought these things. And isn't that the way that with the, you know, it, we see this, this warning throughout Scripture. And, and James, James uh, chapter 5, I think it's about 1 to 4, is very clear where he says, you know, weep and wail, you rich. Why? Because judgment is coming upon you because of how you have acted. You've not paid what is fair. You've, you've stolen from people and made profit out of being evil. And so this is the same thing here. It is these people who are opulently wealthy, rich beyond measure, who have taken from those who can't afford it. The fruit from which your soul longed is gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendor are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gain the wealth from her will stand far off in fear of torment and weeping and mourning, uh, aloud, and they'll say, verse 16, Alas, alas, the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, for in a single hour this, this wealth has been laid waste. Again, they're not lamenting their sin, they're lamenting the fact they can't make money. And again, we have that repetition, one hour. Now we've seen, it, I think it's threefold now, uh, that the timing of this is going to be really quick. Really quick. And, they, um, and when they, they cried out, when they saw the smoke of a burning, what city was like the great city? Well, the answer to that is no city in the world has ever been like this great city. It's going to be a vast metropolis. It's going to glow like, like soul glows. And it's going to be as, as incredible as Dubai. And it's going to be all those cities of the world that you could put together. It's going to be beautiful. And in a single hour, at least, a very, very short space of time is going to be laid waste. And the shipmasters and the seafaring men, that is the, 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 the transport guys, and the captains, and those whose trade was on the sea, they stood far off as well. He's a third group. There's the kings, the merchants, and now we have those who are involved in transporting all the stuff around who's made the hub the hub. These guys... I'll again lament the fact that there's no longer any international or other port trade. They'll cry out with a loud voice when they see the smoke of her, her burning water, what city was like the great city, and they'll throw dust on their heads. You remember that? It's Old Testament reference to, to mourning. It's an outside indication of what's happening within, but in this case, not over sin, over the fact they can't make any money. Um, you see Job 2.12 for that, if you want to see an example. And they say, alas, alas, the great city... Well, all, the, all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth, for in a single hour she's been laid waste. There we go. That's a third of the references to the hours. It's important. When, when the Bible repeats things, you just take note of it, because it is important. Then we see joy. We've seen grief, and now we see joy over Babylon's destruction. Isn't that sort of a juxtaposed, it's sort of set against, one is joy, and the opposite is, uh, one is grief, one is joy. So here we see an opposite view, because this is heaven's view of what's happening here. The, the people of the earth are going to lament the destruction from their standpoint, heaven's going to rejoice. Rejoice over her, O heaven, verse 20, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. The angel, Arabasandra uh, angel, uh, says this, uh, that we're to rejoice, heavens, because of the judgment that God is bringing. Do you remember the, the prayer from Revelation 6, 9, and 10, where the, uh, the, the saints under the altar prayed, how long is it going to be, O Lord, until you repay our blood? Well, here we have God answering that prayer. And they cry out with a loud voice, these guys, O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood uh, on those who judge, uh, and so on those who dwell on the earth? So what's the right response to, to answered prayer, do you think? Joy? Worship? 
And so it is. We have joy. Rejoice. And they do. Judgment completed as verse 21. Then a mighty angel took up a large stone, took up stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon the great be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. Complete massive destruction. So this, another of the same kind angel, and this is the third different angel that we've had in this uh, segment here, picks up a massive stone, stone that's used for grinding mill, or wheat, or some sort of grain. It's huge. It's about 1.5 meters across and about 40 centimeters deep. Can you imagine stone that big? I don't think I could lift that. It's pretty heavy. This angel picks it up and he hurls it into the sea, giving us a metaphor to understand the violence and the, the speed and the totality of the destruction that will come upon the city. And it, that's that that shows it as completed. Here we have, so this, this, this guy, he picks up the stone and with aggression, he throws it into the sea. Speed, violence, completeness, destruction comes to Babylon. Have you ever seen a stone rise out of the water? In the same way, Babylon's not going to rise up again. It's a good picture, isn't it? And for the sake of time, I won't read this, but if you want to compare the description of the destruction of ancient Babylon, which I encourage you to do, note down Jeremiah 51, 61 to 64. Very interesting. And if you have a look at Babylon, ancient Babylon, and compare it with what God wrote about it, it's very interesting. So verse 22, we see the sound of the harpists and the musicians, the flute players. What's happening here? Nothing's going to be happening in Babylon anymore, Babylon the Great. So once judgment comes, there's going to be no harpists, no musicians, no flute players and trumpeters. They'll be heard no more. There won't be any craftsmen. There won't be any engineering. There's going to be no construction. There's going to be no one building buildings. There's going to be no one building fine products made out of ivory or, or stone or of whatever it is or gold or whatever. Nothing, none of that's going to happen. There's going to be no food production anymore. The sound of the mill is why it's not going to be heard. No food production. The light of a lamp. There's not even going to be a light in the city anymore. Complete destruction. The voice of the bride and the bridegroom. No one's going to fall in love in that city anymore. No, none of the normal day, things that happen throughout life, none of that's going to happen. Normal life activity has ceased. It is completely destroyed. And you may think, wow, this is so complete. What could they have done that was so bad to, to have God bring this sort of judgment upon the city? So here we have judgment justified. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth. That's the first thing to remember. The, great, the merchants were the great ones of the earth. So the merchants, those guys, the businessmen, the leaders, and all that, they were the leaders. Like I said, through James, you know, they're the ones who have really come to wealth and power, and they have trampled on those below them. And we can read that in James, as I said. But Isaiah puts it this way. Isaiah um, 8 Four to six. This is a common theme throughout the Bible that those who are rich better be careful that they behave in a godly and righteous way, lest that wealth corrupt them. Here we hear, uh, hear this, you who trample on the needy. Um, sorry, this is Amos. So Amos 8, four to six. Hear this, you who trample on the needy. And bring the poor uh, of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make an ephah small, or the ephah small and a shekel great? Do you get that? An ephah, a, a, a measure. They're going to make that small so they, they oversell, or they, they don't give as much, and they raise the price. So you're going to get less for more. They're going to rip them off. They don't want to do this and deal falsely with, uh, deal deceitfully, deceitfully with false balances. They're going to have it so that if you stick 
one kilo of product here, the scale measures so that you get ripped off. And they're going to say, oh, look, the scale's balanced. You put it on and it's not right. It's in their favor. They're going to rig it. That we might buy, uh, buy for the uh, poor, uh, buy the poor for silver. They want slaves and the needy for a pair of sandals. I wanted it cheap, and sell the uh, chaff of the wheat. What's that worth? Can you get any substance from chaff? They want to sell chaff. These guys are scoundrels. Back to Revelation. It says all the nations were deceived by your sorcery, and this is um, uh, sorcery. There is the uh, Greek word pharmakeia. It's where we get the word pharmacy in the Greek, uh, from uh, in the English language. Pharmacy comes from the Greek word pharmakeia. Why why do they have that here? Why have we why have we trans, uh, translated sorcery? Well. In practices back then, what they used to do in order to commune with the gods, they used to take drugs and therefore lift themselves into some sort of induced way to commune with the spirits. And so we've translated that sorcery because of the use of drugs. And so the world has been deceived by their sorcery. And this could be sort of metaphoric, but I think it's actually probably right as well that there is sorcery going on but either way the world has been deceived they had this demonic influence over the world verse 24 and in here was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all who've been slain on the earth this is really the final nail of the coffin isn't it this is one we can look and go well okay God gives justice here, if you had that in your mind, that God would in some way ever bring in justice, which of course he wouldn't. The final nail is the blood of the prophets and the saints who had been slain on the earth was found in her, probably because, well, wholly because, they were responsible. Antichrist was responsible. I wouldn't be surprised if they were hunting down people who believed in Jesus Christ systematically door to door. I wouldn't be surprised if they were to drag them into an arena and have them in some sort of blood sport for some form of entertainment, just as it was in first century Rome. Either way, the charge against the city and its population is that God's people were killed by them and the blood of the saints and the prophets and the apostles is on their head. For us today, we need to ensure that we are single-minded and that we're focusing on our life on God and his kingdom alone. Thinking back to the idea of the principle, what is the principle here of, of this? If, yes, it is that God will judge Babylon the Great, but for us today, God will do what he says. God is sovereign. God will judge sin. God will judge rightly. We, his people, must be separate from sin, separate from the world, and living for Christ. Now let's, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we have such immense warning as we close out what is the last of the judgments to fall on earth before we again, as the church, feature in this great book of Revelation. Lord, we thank you that we have such a stark warning, Lord, we are truly blessed. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you may use us to walk in a way that is right with you. That, Lord, we know how serious you take sin. We know what is coming. Help us, Lord, to be the faithful church who are saved from the hour of trial. Lord, if there is anyone here who is struggling with sin, Lord, we pray that they'll speak to those who are strong in the faith, who can carry them and guide them. And we ask, Lord, that you'll be with us throughout the rest of this week as we go forth into the world to be in it but not of it. 
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.